So the program for today is that we have uh, an overview of the open air uh, guides for research data management, policy and legal issues. Um, Argos, that's the uh, open air data man tool for data management plans. Zenodo, that doesn't need any, any special introductions because you all knew about that. Um, the open air activ activities for citizen science uh, that have uh, interest for researchers as well. Amnesia, the data anonymization tool, and Open Air Explore, our search engine based on the Open Air Research Graph. Um, before I give the floor to uh, Ellie Dyke to present the RDM uh, guides, I would like to ask Najla Redberg, my colleague, to give you a short overview of the Open Air Guides. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, just share my screen. Does that work? Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not okay. yet. Um, okay. There we go. Right. You can see it now. Yeah, works fine. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, Ilaria already set out the program for today. I thought I'd just give you a quick context to this session um, as well. Uh, this is really a kind of roadshow of all our support materials, of which we have many, specifically targeted for researchers. So we're very much interested in your feedback. We're going to send out a Twitter poll to see if you use our guides and how if you've already heard of them we're interested to have any questions after each of the speakers and get in touch afterwards of course so if you go to our support uh, section in our portal we have a number of different materials so we have primers on open science we have guides on many different aspects of open science and um, open, open access mandates on RDM and all kinds of different uh, aspects on, on open scholarship and open science. We also have some use cases that might be useful in your own institutions. We have a series of fact sheets as well, which summarizes quite short and succinct overviews of, um, of these different aspects. We also have FAQs that you can dip into and we have a help desk so you can ask direct questions to people in your country on open science. So take a look um, as this session is going on and um, yeah, we're very uh, happy to have your feedback. So today we're going to show you specifically the, the guides targeted towards researchers. So thanks for attending and I'll hand you back to Ilaria. Thanks. So um, the first speaker for today is Ellie Dyke from DANCE. Uh, she is the coordinator of the uh, Research Data Management Task Force in Open Air. And Ellie, you can start. Uh, yes, I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. And uh, is my video on or? Yeah, yeah, we can see okay. both your presentation and your face. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, welcome uh, everybody to this presentation about uh, research data management support uh, we've developed in the task force research data management, uh, and it's especially for uh, researchers. Well, as you know that. Uh, uh, European and international organizations uh, promote open science uh, and not only the European uh, Commission, uh, but also, for example, the International Council for Science, uh, the OECD, uh, Science Europe, the organization for uh, national funders. Uh, they, also, they all promote open science and not only open uh, access to publications, but the last year you see more and more uh, open data, uh, uh, open uh, uh, soft research software, open education, etc. Oh. Yes. Uh, so the, uh, the European Commission uh, wants to develop the European Open Science Cloud, the EOSC. And the goal of the EOSC is that every researcher in Europe has access to all the research data 
uh, across borders and, uh, and disciplines. So if you see here uh, the EOS e ecosystem, uh, it's an image by uh, Project Fast Fair. Uh, you see uh, turning uh, FAIR into reality. Uh, FAIR stands for uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, and you see that uh, there are many projects uh, or working groups uh, busy with developing the, the EOS. And one of them is, of course, Open Air. You can see it at the uh, uh, top right. And um, the, the members of Open Air are also, uh, Open Air is working uh, also with other uh, projects, but also members of the Open Air are also members, members in other uh, projects. So I come now to the Task Force Research Data Management established in, uh, in Open Air. Um, uh, DANS, uh, my institute, and, uh, is leading this task force. I do it together with my uh, colleague, Anna Leenaert. Um, the goal of the task force is to increase the knowledge uh, among the NOAAs uh, on this subject, on research data management, open data, fair data, the EOS. And what are the NOAAs? Uh, NOAAs are the National Open Access Desk from Open Air, is that? And it's every country has one, and they promote uh, open science in their country and uh, have contact with the open uh, science communities in their country. So this task force now has 31 uh, members, 20 of them are NOAAs, and we established working groups and we looked at the different elements of the research data life cycle. I will come to that uh, later in my next slide. So we collected uh, examples of uh, existing good practices in every country. Uh, of course, you understand that a lot of countries, uh, institutes, are busy uh, with research data management. And we try to find gaps uh, and uh, develop new uh, RDM materials. So the output is online guides, webinar, blog posts, etc. Uh, and not only for uh, researchers, uh, but also for uh, data librarians. And that's indirectly to uh, also for researchers. Um, as I said, so we established uh, working groups. Now we have, uh, at this moment, we have six working groups. Uh, DMP resources, methodology for developing uh, RDM roadmaps, data reuse examples, the importance of long-term preservation, use cases of DMPs of existing projects. Uh, a survey will start at the end of this year, how do researchers in your institute manage their data? And of course, we have the promotion of the task force outputs. And not only uh, dance is leading these, these working groups, but also uh, CNN, CNR in, uh, in Italy, uh, DCC, Digital Curation Center in the UK, and uh, the University of Vienna. So if you look at the research data life cycle, it's from the UK Data Archive, uh, then you can see when a researcher starts his, his or her research uh, is uh, creating the data. Uh, and there's a plan made, uh, a plan has been made for the research, uh, the a plan consent for, uh, for sharing a collection of data that can be a reuse of data, of course. Um, but also uh, making a data management plan. Uh, as you know, this is a require, uh, requirement for uh, Horizon 2020 projects. You have to make a data management plan in the first six months after the approval of, the, of your uh, research. And very handy here is uh, Argos and DMP tool. It is one of the topics later this, uh, this session. It's not an output of the RDM task force, but it's quite uh, useful. And we also have a, a very nice infographic, uh, cost to manage and share data. You can find it in, uh, in Sunodo, also a topic later. Uh, for processing the data, uh, the researcher has to enter the data, digitize it, uh, uh, validate it, clean the data, of course, with documentation. 
uh, manage and uh, store the data for the short uh, term. And we have a very nice um, uh, guide for researchers uh, how to deal with non-digital data. Uh, we've made a webinar with EOSC Hub, it's another uh, Horizon 2020 project, Data Privacy and Sensitive Data Services. Uh, and we have a blog post, Electronic Lab Notes, Shufuko E, and I will talk about it later as an example. In analyzing the data, uh, the researcher has to think about prepare the data for publication. Um, there's a web nice uh, webinar on amnesia, uh, because also to anonymize the the data is important here. Also, Amnesia is not a project of the it's not a product of the task force, but uh, uh, very uh, useful here. Then we have preserving uh, the data. Uh, preserving the data is uh, uh, store the data and create metadata and try to uh, find the best uh, format. So we have. Uh, uh, guides for it, uh, storing sensitive data, find a trustworthy, trustworthy repository, data formats for preservation, raw data, backup and versioning. You can all find it uh, in Synoda and also on the website of Open Air, of course. Then giving access to data, well, you can think that it's important to think about licensing of, or uh, copyright. Uh, uh, and there are products in the other task force uh, about it, the task force uh, with, about the legal issues. Um, but it's also uh, good to have uh, uh, identifiers, persistent identifiers. And we have a, a guide for researchers, identifiers to improve dissemination, uh, managing access to sensitive data, and a webinar with Freya. Freya is uh, also a, a European project on persistent identifiers. And this webinar is new developments in the field of persistent identifiers. So then we come to the last uh, item, reusing data. And this has been a topic uh, for the last few months of, uh, of our task force. Um, so we're still expecting a number of blog posts on data reuse with data reuse examples. Well, you can imagine it's not uh, necessary for every researcher to, you, to reuse uh, data, but imagine that you uh, want to compare the uh, socioeconomic situation of a country with 30 years ago, then it would be nice to have also the, the data of uh, 30 years ago. So then I will come to a few uh, examples. Um, I already talked about it, the electronic lab notebooks. Um, this is a very handy uh, uh, blog post with, uh, this, uh, that describes uh, the electronic lab notebooks, but also is very uh, useful because it says uh, which tool to choose uh, and gives uh, examples of it. The same you see with uh, data formats for preservation. Uh, in this guide, the context has been uh, described, uh, why it's necessary, but also how to deal with this and then uh, give examples. And also you see uh, uh, below the type of uh, data and recommended uh, formats, uh, have it, uh, the type of data uh, can be uh, documents, it can be images, can be, ima uh, can be videos, what is the best uh, format to, uh, to uh, store your data. Well, the same is with uh, how to find the trustworthy uh, repositories, uh, repository for your data, also very practical. Uh, well, you know uh, that by default, Horizon 2020 projects participate uh, in the open research data pilot, so they have to uh, submit their data to a repository. And here you can find uh, some uh, steps uh, that you can follow. Uh, use a disciplinary repository if you if there is one, because then they have the uh, the the, met, the right metadata structure for you. Uh, you can use an institutional repository. You can uh, put it in Synodo. 
or you search uh, a repository in the vcdata.org portal and try to find a trustworthy repository. That means that uh, the repository will take care uh, about, you, about your data for the long term. And that is, of course, very important. So we have more outputs. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't mention uh, everything, but there are uh, blog posts uh, on institutional RDM support. Uh, this is more for the data lib librarians with, with examples of uh, the support in different institutes in different uh, countries. A very nice diagram. I will show it you, to you later. Deposit your data in the data repository for long-term preservation why, when, how, what, where to deposit. And we expect the overview of, uh, of uh, European Commission DMPs around thousands in the repository of the University of, uh, of Vienna. So researchers can, uh, can look at other uh, DMPs and see how it can be filled in, for example. Uh, and here's a nice uh, diagram, uh, deposit your data in the data repository, and what to deposit, for example, and then you can find the criteria to decide what data to keep. Uh, for example, because your institute requires that you keep the data for 10 years or, or other examples. Uh, so this is uh, the whole uh, output of the task force, the guides and the webinars, and also the blog post, and you can all, you can all find it on the on the open air uh, website, uh, the web page of the task force. And of course, there is much more. There are uh, um, guides and uh, there are other guides, fact sheets and, uh, and, and facts there are. So you can find a lot of information that can be useful for you uh, when you're doing uh, research. And not only uh, when you do Horizon 2020 research, but also uh, 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 other subsidized uh, research. So that was my last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, so this is an invite for all the participants to, um, yeah, I mean, uh, check the, the pages that Ali presented and put any questions in the Q&A section uh, that you find at the bottom of your Zoom window. Thanks a lot, Ali. Okay, I'll stop share. Uh, Stop yeah. sharing now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, I will move then to Marina Angelaki from EKT in Greece, uh, who is the leading uh, person of the policy task force and will also present the outcomes of the, uh, po the legal task force. Okay, thanks Marina. Okay, so uh, I guess you can hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you, but your presentation is not in full screen. Okay, now it is. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you, Ilaria. Um, so welcome, uh, everybody, and thank you for your um, interest in the work that we're doing in the, in the task forces. Uh, my presentation will focus on the activities of the legal and, uh, and policy task force and in particular uh, um, in the work that we've done um, um, in particular on the, on the legal um, uh, aspects. Uh, um, as you can understand, the, the, um, the work of the RDM task force and also the work uh, that is done in the context of the legal and policy task force uh, are obviously um, um, interlinked. Uh, so the Legal and Policy Task Force uh, is uh, led by um, Thomas Margoni from the University of Glasgow, uh, Prodromos Tiavos from the Athena Research Center, and myself from the National Documentation Center, or um, EKT. Um, the, um, uh, the aim of the, um, of the task force um, is, uh, is to support, uh, um, obviously, researchers, but also legal support staff uh, and also uh, policymakers. 
Um, we aim uh, to support research performing and research funding organizations in the adoption of open science policies by highlighting and discussing with them the, the main elements that a policy uh, should include, but also by um, highlighting uh, uh, legal, um, uh, legal aspects that are um, involved in, uh, in, in, in such a uh, task. Uh, obviously, a key issue is the alignment with the uh, horizon uh, uh, framework and um, overall to, to discuss all the aspects that are uh, um, that one needs to take into consideration when making research uh, outputs uh, openly um, available. Um, the, the policy and legal task force has a total of 25 uh, members, 15 of which are, are NOADs. Uh, as Ellie mentioned before, the, the NOADs are the uh, National Open Access uh, uh, Desk. There is one in um, in every in every country, and they are um, a key element, um, obviously, of uh, um, of open air, but also of this uh, of this effort. Um, as the um, the aim of the task force is on the one hand to um, enhance the the expertise uh, and the competencies of the NOAD so that they can in turn um, support their uh, uh, their own communities. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, our work is uh, relies a lot uh, on the NOADs in the sense that uh, we seek uh, their uh, feedback and the the materials that we uh, produced are to a large extent based uh, on the on the feedback that we get from from NOADs uh, based on their needs and the, the requests um, that um, um, that uh, emerge from from the interaction with their um, communities. Um, so regarding the main outputs and outcomes of the uh, of the task force, um, we have developed uh, um, a toolkit for researchers on legal issues that I will talk more uh, about in a few minutes. Uh, also a toolkit for policymakers on open access and uh, open science. Uh, both of these toolkits are available on the open air portal, but also uh, on, on Zenodo. Um, we have also um, organized uh, a number of uh, uh, of, uh, of webinars uh, focusing on both um, uh, policy developments in in uh, in uh, different uh, open air countries, uh, where uh, we had the opportunity to share um, experiences and and show what uh, worked and what uh, didn't work. And in particular, over the, the past year, we organized uh, two webinars in uh, last April and in May, focused on uh, research uh, data um, regulation and uh, highlighting issues such as uh, um, the ownership, uh, access, uh, storing and reuse of uh, research data. Um, taking into consideration the uh, the pandemic, we also used examples uh, from the biomedical sciences and, and medical uh, data to um, as as practical um, examples. Um, you can read more about the the webinar on the related. Um, uh, blog post, and you can also find uh, other blog posts that relate to uh, um, um, national developments related to um, to policy um, aspects. And uh, we have also produced a number of uh, of policy of uh, sorry of uh, guides uh, focusing on uh, on legal um, uh, issues. Uh, before moving to the legal issues, um, I will uh, I will mention that uh, for the on the basis of the toolkit for for policymakers, you can find on the um, uh, open air uh, portal um, um, policy templates that are uh, targeted to research funding organizations and research performing organizations who wish either to adopt uh, an open science uh, uh, policy 
or uh, um, um, RPOs and RFOs who wish to uh, um, align their policies with the uh, um, European framework. Um, so they can use this material um, in their efforts to, um, uh, to adopt policies. And we have also uh, developed a, a checklist so uh, that uh, either RPOs or RFOs can check their um, readiness, the, the level of readiness in terms of um, um, their, their open uh, science policies. Um, so um, our our efforts during this past year have focused more on the on the legal um, uh, on the legal aspects, as I as I mentioned before, and we have produced a number of uh, of guides. Um, these are mainly targeted to researchers, but obviously um, they can be of use to other stakeholders, whether we're talking about librarians who are supporting uh, researchers or um, any other stakeholder. Um, what we had in mind in producing this, uh, these guides is the fact that uh, most of us, and uh, I include my, my, myself as well, are not legal experts and uh, um, we, we sometimes feel um, uh, not very at ease when we have to deal with uh, um, uh, legal aspects when trying to make our research uh, um, outputs uh, open. Um, so these guides are an effort to um, um, to support the community um, by um, providing uh, answers to a number of questions that uh, usually come up in a, in a non-technical uh, um, in a non-technical manner. Um, so. Um, the, the, the first of these guides, how do I know if my research uh, data is, uh, um, sorry, is, uh, is protected, um, provides a definition regarding what uh, uh, research data are, as we know that uh, different disciplines use different types of uh, data, so um, uh, confusion some, sometimes may arise as to what uh, constitutes uh, research data. Um, it explains how the different rules on uh, research data may impact on their use. Um, and also it, uh, it presents um, uh, what copyright law is, uh, who, who owns uh, the copyright and what copyright owners uh, can do among other things. Um, the second guide, uh, how do I license my data, uh, um, explains what uh, the Creative Commons license uh, is, uh, how licenses can be applied to, to research uh, data, and how one can use uh, these licenses for the, um, the purpose of, um, uh, of making the research uh, outputs uh, open access. Um, the third one uh, deals with the, the reuse of uh, research uh, data and uh, um, tackles issues uh, um, relating to the, the reuse of a protective, a protected uh, data sets um, and how to use a data set that has uh, um, no license and what the, the risks uh, um, um, are in, 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 in such a, um, a case. Um, so in terms of the, uh, of our, um, uh, future work, uh, um, obviously we, um, we would like to, um, to produce, um, um, additional support either through, uh, uh, pr uh producing, uh, um, additional guides or organizing, uh, uh webinars, um, on the basis, um, not only of the, our, uh, uh, NOAA network, uh, needs and requests, but we feel that this this is also um, a nice opportunity, um, this, um, um, this webinar, um, um, to, to seek your, your, your input and your, your, your feedback. Uh, we would like, obviously, um, to know whether you have used any of these uh, uh, guides and if you feel that there are any additional um, support materials that we could uh, uh, produce as, uh, as open air. And uh, uh, we always uh, um, uh, seek to find synergies with other organizations and, and initiatives uh, uh, and provide our, our input uh, in terms of um, uh, the policies that are, are, are being developed based on our um, expertise. Um, so this is all from, from my side. Thank you very much for, for your attention.
Thank you very much, Marina. Uh, and this is again an invite for uh, our participants also to have a look at, the, at the, our Twitter channel because there's a poll about the usage of the guides. But uh, in case you, are, you have been using, you or your institutions or some of your colleagues uh, have been using uh, one or many of these open air guides, please let us know because we are, we are particularly interested in understanding uh, their usability and if there's something we can improve around them. So thank you very much. So next speaker is Eli Papadopoulou from the Athena Research Center in Athens, Greece, uh, that will speak about Argos, uh, that's the uh, open air DMP tool that has been recently relaunched. So uh, I'm particularly excited about that. Eli, thanks. Thank you, Laria. I hope you're uh, listening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So. Yes, yes. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, your time to participate uh, and to take part in this uh, session today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Argos, which is a service that Opener has developed, and it's all about data management planning. Uh, this one, uh, the little girl that you see, it's not me, actually. I don't uh, talk to the designers who told them uh, to create me. This is just an avatar that we have. This is me, as you can see in the camera, but now I will stop the video so that we all have a better uh, internet connection and I will move on to my <clears throat> presentation. So let's see um, what Argos is about. Uh, my presentation will uh, have a brief introduction of uh, why we developed the tool and then I will move on to uh, saying a few words about the key features uh, that uh, stand out of, uh, in Argos, then um, how Opener um, uh, interacts with Argos and where does Argos stand in the Opener ecosystem, what are the service enhancements and so on, of um, what you're viewing in the interface of Argos and then I will uh, conclude with a few next steps. Um, let's see what is Argos uh, and actually why it was developed, uh, the need that it addresses. Uh, we all know that in the latest years there's a huge demand for this data management. So as researchers and as students and as people that are uh, doing, uh, are involved in research data management, we need to uh, understand uh, pro understand what are the different steps involved in a research data management life cycle, as you can see here. Um, this, is a, this is a paradigm example. But also we need to understand nowadays what, what, what is, the, of course, the proper way to manage and handle our data throughout the research lifecycle and what are the open aspects that we can find in which, in which different steps we can find them and how we can uh, address them. And uh, similarly, how fair principles uh, can be found uh, in, uh, in a research data man management lifecycle and how we can follow the, these both open and fair principles in order to uh, achieve uh, fairness of data and fairness also of all the other outputs that we produce um, uh, in, in, in our research. Um, this is what uh, UDAT and OpenAir uh, collaborated actually on to develop a software, an open source software, that uh, allows uh, to be that is configurable and extensible, and it provides researchers with more flexibility uh, to the handling of their data within, uh, that they include in a data management plan. So uh, Argos is actually, you can see, I hope my, uh, the mouse here, the cursor, uh, and Argos actually is built on uh, this software, uh, the OpenDMP software, and um, uh, provides this platform uh, through Opener um, to create machine actionable DMPs, meaning DMPs that can have, a, that can be then um, 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 measurable, measurable, like you can understand what is the usage of the DMPs, and you can actually, um, you can actually see how DMPs evolve throughout the time. Um, and then we have other functionalities. You can also publish DMPs and I will, I will talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, yes, so let's see how you can use Argos uh, as, a, as a research. Um, the features that Argos has that stand out are the following. So first and foremost is that uh, in Argos, you, we differentiate DMPs from datasets. 
That means that you will find two different editors. One is for the, for the DMP, a DMP editor, and the other one is for the dataset, a dataset editor. And why we're doing this is you, you will find the, in the DMP editor, you can actually add information that has to do with the scope of your DMP, why it is uh, created, who is it involved in the creation of the DMP, uh, and all the basic information around the, the research and the data management plan. Um, that you're creating and then on the data set editor you can have more specialized information like for uh, like according to how you have applied the first principles for example and open access principles in your data when managing and handling your data and this is very useful uh, it means that you can have a dmp that contains more than one data descriptions of data sets and you can for example uh, have a dmp that has um, a data set that is described with specific metadata standards that uh, have to do with uh, archaeology because you are having a, you, you have a collection of archaeological data that you are describing and then let's say that you have some sensitive data that you also want to describe so you can create a different description for this data and actually hide them before you publish them uh, in uh, or share them uh, with uh, more bro more broadly and more publicly and this is um, this is very handy for, for this and it actually allows you to copy and paste and move around the data sets uh, and copy and paste them in different DMPs. So let's say that I want this sensitive data set uh, to, to reuse it in a different DMP that has different context and I can easily grab it, copy and put it in a different DMP that I'm working in Argos. So it makes a reuse of uh, descriptions of data set easier. Um, another key feature is that a DMP can contain more than one templates and this is uh, important for two reasons. I will, I will at least uh, say two reasons. Uh, one is that um, you may be working for uh, an international project that has uh, received funding from many funders and, and big funders that all or some of them require uh, the uh, require you to create data management plans according to their um, requirements. You are, a, uh, you are able to do it by using Argos. You can select more than one template to describe your data sets and you can uh, allocate depending on where you want to add it and which, uh, which template you want to, to describe your data set at each time. Uh, the, the one thing that you can use this feature is that for international projects, for example. And the other one is that, let's say that you work, uh, that, that you are working for a multidisciplinary project uh, that um, collects and reuses and generates data that are uh, of, of many types, like simulation data uh, or uh, stati statistical data, different, different types of data. Uh, and different discipline data. For example, let's say that I, I, will, I have been working in a project that also deals with social data and archaeological data. I can uh, select as many templates as I want based on the discipline. I can select, for example, the Horizon 2020, which is the generic, and then I have a different one, which is the Horizon 2020 Ariadne Plus for uh, archaeological data that provides a little bit more, um, that, that actually gets into more uh, details for uh, how um, uh, how the Horizon 2020 template is um, ca can be used in archaeological data. Um, another thing that you can do with Argos is actually it, you can easily select resources that come from Opener and from EOSC uh, through the API that we're using. And you can do that without having to exit our interface. You can learn about uh, specific RDM concepts like metadata, what is metadata, and where to find metadata standards. And actually, you can easily select them from, from the editors and add them in your template without having to um, check them out uh, and go to, to different um, sources externally. Of course, you're able to do it. And, uh, another thing is that Argo supports collaborative writing. Uh, mean, it means that you can invite your uh, colleagues and work uh, collaboratively, collaborate with them, work with them, and manage workload um, to, to in the writing process of the DMP. 
Um, then it also supports JSON format. Uh, it also, you, you can export your DMP in lots of formats like text, um, PDF, XML, but uh, the most important, at least uh, um, for interoperability reasons, is the JSON format that is uh, compliant with the RDA DMP standard. And uh, but for that, if you export our, uh, if you export a DMP that you created in Argos and upload it in a, in another RDA compliant platform, then you will be able to use the to use it and continue work without uh, noticing any difference in the information that you have provided without missing any information. Uh, and vice versa, of course, you can download something from an RDA compliant um, platform and then upload it and import in, in Argos and continue work from Argos and deposit it to Argos and Oro, etc. And this is uh, similar to how you would do, for example, when you're working on a deliverable and you start uh, creating a, a text document uh, using Google Docs and then you download it, you upload it in a OneDrive and you continue work. So this is what we're trying to catch uh, by, by doing this, uh, try to um, uh, f facilitate an uninterrupted uh, process uh, for, for, for researchers and allow them to move around and uh, choose the tool that they want uh, easily without losing any vital information. And also it provides, uh, you, you can assign DOIs uh, by using Argos. Uh, we treat DMPs as outputs, as I said in the beginning, so you can assign your DOI, your license, and also have different versions. So freeze the DMP that you're working at any given time and uh, share it with your colleagues or deposit it in the nodo from Argos uh, directly uh, and then continue uh, work by creating a new version. And all, the and all the different versions you can do at any time so we keep track of uh, different versions for DMP. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but I will start uh, talking maybe a little bit uh, quicker. Uh, the role that you uh, can have in Argos uh, is either as a DMP manager or as a DMP collaborator. The differences are not that big, like both of uh, managers and collaborators can have, have all the edit rights. They can add information templates, they can um, discard information, they can save information, but the DMP managers, meaning those that have initially created the DMP, are those that uh, can also only finalize the DMP. These are the only people that can finalize the DMP and publish the DMP is another. Uh, this is the only uh, um, difference, let's say. And collaborators, meaning those that have been invited by the managers to work on a specific uh, DMP. Um, now let's see how this, these all are possible uh, and many things, but these are the key things that are, um, these are possible due to a uh, few integrations with the open air ecosystems. We are lucky to be involved in the, in the open air ecosystem and make use of other underlying services such as provide, for example, such as Zenodo. As I said, we integrate Zenodo and you can, um, you can immediately uh, from Argos uh, close uh, this, um, this DMP lifecycle and publish it uh, directly from Argos to Zenodo get your DOI and get cited. Uh, we are actually progressively, uh, we are integrating with other um, open air services like Provide. Uh, we have um, soon, in the, in the next uh, couple of months, but by the end of the year, let's say, we will have the, the, the option to uh, deposit in all open air compliant repositories from uh, Argos and all the other services I'm not going to go into detail but we also integrate um, the open science primers and uh, the outputs that were mentioned by Ellie um, earlier we also integrate them in the templates so that we provide uh, more guidance to researchers to understand the basic concepts like the, the license that they have to, that, that they could use uh, the data what it is and what are the standards around it how, the, how they could use it all the guides we try to incorporate in in the templates that we that we include in Argos so that we make navigation easier and understanding easier and also thanks to the NOAAs that I've listed some of them here because there are too many and I couldn't uh, catch, catch them all and thanks to the NOAAs we also have uh, Argos 
in uh, different translate uh, translated in different languages so you might be you might see if you go now to argos.openr.eu uh, you might see your language uh, already argos translated in your language already which is very uh, very uh, good and, and very useful and here i've uh, i've added the um, uh, open air research graph. So this is from the open air research graph. It shows their different relations and the different entities included in open air. And Argos actually uh, is, we're now working with uh, the, the research graph and it's, uh, we're creating a DMP entity uh, here and we're making the relationships with uh, the different other entities like with the research product. So what, what DMP uh, is associated with what data set, with what publication, funder, et cetera. We're, we're trying to enrich uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, open scholarly communication graph that Opener has. Uh, very quickly, latest achievements. Uh, we, uh, we collaborated with Eragni Plus that, uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, we had a very fruitful collaboration, worked on our templates and DMP tools and produced uh, some, uh, some um, we have some good outcomes of this collaboration. You can find them out in our latest uh, blog post about Argos and Eragni Plus collaboration. Uh, we uh, took part in the RDA hackathon and we were very happy to, uh, to, to, to get to know and to collaborate with uh, the, research, the global research data community and we actually won <laughs> the, this hackathon. So this gave us the incentive to release a new version of Argos and for, for which we really would appreciate your feedback since this is, this is, for, the, this is for researchers. Uh, this tool was created by the demands of researchers and the fair and open community and for this. So we, really, we would really appreciate your feedback uh, to make this um, better for you. Uh, ongoing, some integrations. I'm not going to go into much detail. If you want to see more templates, please contact us. Some useful resources here. I know that I'm out of time, so thank you very much. I would be happy to uh, answer any questions later. Thank you very much, Ali, also for being time conscious. Um, yeah, the release of Argos is definitely interested, interesting for, for many of the participants. So if you have any questions, please uh, do put them in, in the, in the Q&A box. Uh, now it's the turn of Alex Ioannidis from CERN. He is working on Zenodo. I mean, I would say that you are the leader of the Zenodo development, right? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Hello. can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can yes, hear you. I've been, uh, I've been, uh, yeah, I've been leading the, the development and the operations and generally running the, the, the service for the, the past uh, two years. Well, okay, so I, did, I didn't make a mistake. Um, your presentation is not in a presenter mode, though. Uh, okay, uh, should be okay. great. Should be. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so thank you all for joining the session and thank you for, uh, for the <clears throat> Uh, for your time. So uh, I will try to briefly go through, through what the Zenodo is and uh, what, we, what uh, we've been doing and how we've been trying to serve researchers for the past uh, almost seven years, let's say. <coughs> uh, so my name is Alex Nelis. I'm, I'm working at CERN, where the Zenodo is also hosted. Uh, and Zenodo was made for many reasons, but uh, basically one of the ideas that uh, disaster strikes from time to time and uh, you might have done a lot of research and you might have uh, worked on something for a long time but uh, sometimes get, things get tricky and you might lose uh, flash drives or laptops and uh, also it doesn't matter if you physically store things maybe in libraries or museums like th things will always uh, deter over time. So the idea is that Zenodo is, is a platform that helps not only with preserving things but the idea is that it's also it's also helping to, to, to publish and Kind of like share and interlink all of the research objects with other platforms. <coughs> uh, the basic principles of Zenodo is that uh, users can upload any types of uh, files. So this, is, this always has to be a file with a, with a Zenodo record. Uh, we allow up to 50 gigabytes for, for each record for each data set that's uploaded, but you can upload as many data sets as you want. Uh, <coughs> we accept all kinds of file formats. So we accept videos, uh, data sets, zip files, uh, Presentations, PDFs, everything. It's, it's not a, there's no limit in, in what if you want to store it and preserve it, we will take it and, and, and 
so the thing is that you upload your files, then you describe them. And we, what we try to do here is to have uh, like a very flexible metadata schema, which is rich, but at the same time doesn't limit users. So it allows, for example, for, for you to quickly you know, upload something, describe it very briefly, like with the title, with the authors and some descriptions. And, uh, and then it's up to you if you want to kind of like expand and, and add more, uh, more metadata to the, to the record. For example, you could add funding information. So <clears throat> thanks to Open Air, uh, who's, who's doing a great work at, at, at maintaining basically a, a big database of, of uh, grants and, and, uh, and awards that are <clears throat> from different kind of agencies, funding agencies. Uh, we have, we can, we can, you can always connect your records and your outputs to, like, let's say, the funding where it came from. Uh, you can always, uh, you can pick from a vast array of licenses we also have. Uh, another very interesting part of this step is that sometimes you want to publish something in a journal, uh, but for example, you, you, you want to cite the data set, but uh, there's always this process where, you know, there's a, there's, a journal, there's, a, there's a journal review process where you want the DOI for something, but you don't want it published yet. So you can always know the DOI of something before publishing it. And uh, of course, after you publish, you get this citable DOI, which will always, will always resolve to somewhere and people can always uh, reliably kind of excite it and, and share it and, and follow it to, to, to find the files that you've uh, uploaded. And uh, <coughs> we provide it in many, let's say, indexable and exportable formats, uh, in JSON, in dataset XML, in, uh, in, uh, <coughs> and uh, yeah, also some other formats. And uh, of course, there's a, there's a REST API and an OAI PMH API that you can use to access and harvest uh, uh, the log. And of course, we, we track some user statistics. So, uh, to give you an example of, of the kind of like rich metadata, like how deep we can go in terms of rich metadata and in terms of different, different disciplines, uh, because in other, in its core, it's a, it's a general purpose repository. So, anybody can upload anything, but uh, <coughs> so we don't discriminate against any discipline, but uh, if you want, you can go very deep and you can, for example, uh, <coughs> use very custom metadata for the, for the kind of uh, object that you upload. For example, here we have biodiversity uh, records which describe, uh, for example, the, the species and the kingdom and the, all these different uh, kind of like very specific metadata that are very domain specific. Right? And of course, we have more generic metadata like location information. And, uh, so besides that, uh, we kind of understand that uh, research objects, they, they evolve over time. So for example, we have uh, data sets and software. We know that for software, it's kind of like a natural process to, to always have new releases and always uh, get new uh, versions of things published. And uh, this is very tightly integrated into the platform. So for example, if you have a data set and you add new data or you refine the data, you can create a new version. And this is always tracked. Like you have a, you have a, you have a single DUI for all the versions so you can Kind of like specifically cite them. And of course, also you have a DUI for all of the versions. So it's kind of like a, an encompassing DUI, which allows you to cite everything. Um, besides that, uh, we also track the statistics for each individual version. And of course, we have statistics for the whole, uh, let's say, research object as well. Uh, <clears throat> another feature that Zenodo has is uh, what we call communities. So uh, Zenodo normally is, is like a big, let's say, a collection of, of all sorts of records and different disciplines, but the idea is that users can uh, create their own smaller repositories inside the model. And this is where they can organize and uh, better, let's say, uh, like manage what kind of records uh, and uh, uh, they want to, to, to describe it. So for example, if you have a project or, a, or if you're an institution or for a conference maybe or a subject, you could create a community on the model. You can uh, set what we call a curation policy of what kind of records do you accept and what is, uh, what's kind of like the purpose of the community. And then you as a record curator, you can, you have the ability to, to decide what gets accepted and what gets rejected into this community. And this is a way for you to kind of like manage and curate uh, pages and so on. Uh, besides that, from the very, very beginning, we tried to, to make software uh, a first class citizen of, of, the, of the research world. So, uh, we know that a lot of the development happens usually on, Git, on, on GitHub uh, and uh, researchers that, that work with software, uh, they want to publish the things on GitHub and they want to, to, to keep their workloads there. So basically we, we don't want to invade into this uh, process and kind of like take them out of this uh, world and uh, uh, have them do something else. So 
we kind of like tightly integrate with GitHub in a way that uh, you just work on GitHub, you publish your releases, you, you do what you do, and then uh, we automatically kind of like archive all of this, uh, this software on the Zenodo side. And this is kind of like a, a something that you, you just flip a switch and then you forget about it. And uh, then software becomes a citable object and you can uh, uh, kind of receive like recognition. And uh, yeah. so besides that, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, Zenodo is accessible via REST API and the uh, OIP uh, endpoint. And the idea is that any kind of operation that normally happens on Zenodo via the, the upload forms that we have can also be done programmatically. So you can set workflows around Zenodo, you can uh, set up automations, and uh, of course you can also harvest Zenodo for your own purposes to, to collect statistics or to, to index something. And, uh, and, that's, uh, uh, <coughs> and also besides that, uh, on each Zenodo record, something that we've been Kind of like uh, lately doing is we're trying to display like uh, we, have, we have another service which is basically harvesting citations and uh, tries to aggregate them based on what we what uh, these versioning schemes that we have uh, kind of like uh, we track so basically you can see citations to specific versions of uh, of records and you can also see let's say the bigger aggregation of, uh, of the citations that the things receive and we try to harvest different sources. Uh, I think uh, there's, there's very good work also done on the openness side, it's called Explorer, which does exactly the same, like they, they harvest many, many, uh, many different resources and they, and they, they make them available. Uh, <coughs> and then to give you kind of like a bigger overview of what Zenodo has been, uh, looks like in numbers. So at the moment we start about uh, 1.6 million records. Uh, it's, there's a lot of text, so there's the publication and preprints and, and the reports. Uh, DMPs are also part of this, so what, what Argos, uh, the outputs of Argos are uh, considered text outputs in Zenodo. Uh, we have a lot of images and figures, uh, and we also have a lot of, as I mentioned, software. So we just recently reached uh, uh, 100,000 uh, basically uh, archived software DOIs in the, on, on Zenodo. Uh, we have uh, it, it, around 80,000 data sets. This all amounts to about 235 terabytes of data. It's 5 million files stored here at the, at the CERN data center. And at the moment, we, we're busy from all around the world. We have around 5 million visitors uh, per year at this point. Uh, <clears throat> as part of the COVID response, uh, we try to make, kind of like the, to offer what we, what we can do best to the, to the public. So basically, we we prioritize all of the requests related to the COVID-19 outbreak. So if you just want to upload data sets or, uh, for example, uh, uh, have bigger, let's say, quotas for, for, for uploading much bigger data sets, because that's, uh, or, uh, or for example, if they want to upload data sets more regularly, we, we try to help them to, to set up scripts and automations and kind of like uh, make their lives easier in these in this, uh, difficult times. Uh, and of course, we also went through the, through the process of curating these records. And uh, this also happened with the, with the help of, uh, of uh, Irina and, uh, and uh, Lavros and Opener to, to make this community, to have an open community, to have a community here in Zenodo, which, uh, which uh, collects all of these records and makes them kind of like easily available to others. And uh, this kind of thing. So for the, let's say for the future plans of Zenodo, uh, of course we've seen that uh, it's, uh, it has become a very popular platform and of course, everybody wants to have their own Zenodo where, which they can customize and add this and the other feature and do all of these things. Uh, <clears throat> and this is what actually happened. Zenodo is open source, so anybody can actually uh, clone it and set it up for themselves. And uh, to kind of like tackle this issue, we said, okay, let's kind of like gather all these partners, all these different universities and institutions, and uh, try to make something bigger out of, uh, out of all of this, uh, out of all of these efforts. And uh, this is kind of like what, what we're planning to do with Zenodo, like what's, what's the next version of Zenodo. So uh, basically combined almost 20 plus partners to and the universities, institutions and companies uh, uh, to build something bigger and, and uh, basically enhance all the features that Zenodo already has. So for example, communities is kind of like a very monolithic and very, uh, very modular kind of like a feature at the moment and the idea is to to enhance it and add more user roles, uh, have plugins, have, uh, I can say, custom facets and, 
for customizations to how records inside communities look and how communities look in general. Um, and uh, that's it. So I think questions are going to be coming later, I guess. So yeah so uh there are questions coming in the q a uh we will address them at the end of the presentations but in case there are some that you think you can answer directly you can as a panelist uh, answer them directly in the q a box okay. Okay. thanks uh, alex for the very interesting presentation uh and now we switch to the open science citizen activities in open air uh, the speaker is uh, Eugenia Kipriotis from the, I, I try to speak, uh, to, to pronounce it, Elinobir Vanikiagogi in Athens. Well, and uh, Eugenia, it's, exactly. it's your time. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm just starting my screen now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Give me some time. You must yeah. see my presentation now. Is everything yeah, okay? It works fine. Thanks. Great. So, Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Laria, for the introduction. This is uh, uh, Eugenia Kipriotis. I work for Elino Germaniki Agogi, or otherwise, uh, you can just call us EA. Uh, we are actually um, an R&D department belonging to a, a big private school in Athens. And uh, today, we're, um, we're going to present you the citizen science activities that we have uh, uh, initiated in the framework of open air. So um, just uh, some directions for the beginning. Um, what, we, what we had to do in this task was that we had to uh, form uh, activities, educational activities um, that could um, involve citizen science. The, the, um, the trick here was though that we had to find initiatives that would fit to school settings, and that would also uh, fit to the interests of uh, students and their teachers. Ideally, we would like to, to, to create something that would be easy for the teachers, easily adapted to the national curricula. So we come up with uh, we came up with three three initiatives. Um, the first one is the school seismograph network, where we gather seismic data. The second one is the Open Schools Journal for Open Science, where we're talking about an open science journal uh, with um, articles from students and addressing to students. And then, last but not least, an initiative we are calling Bringing Nobel Prize Physics to Classroom, where we're actually giving access to students and uh, their teachers, access to research uh, data. Let's uh, take them one by one to see what we're doing in, in, in these fields. So the first one is about the, the seismic data journey. As I told you, we have created a network of seismographs. Um, in, as you can see in this map, uh, we're covering the um, southeastern part of Mediterranean, which is actually the, the part of Europe most prone to earthquakes. Its triangle on this map represents one seismograph. So actually, we are expanding from Azores to Israel. Um, the locations are mostly um, uh, decided on the seismic activity, on the importance of the seismic activity in each location, and in some cases also the volcanic activity. That's why we have placed um, seismographs in Azores, in Sadorini, Thira, in Nisiros, places with great volcanic activity. Um, all these seismographs are hosted in schools. Please keep that because I will explain later the importance. Everyone, not just the schools belonging to this network, even you, if you visit the, this network, you can click on the seismograph and this is the visualization of what you, you get from the seismic data they, go, they gather, gather, I'm sorry, from these uh, seismographs. All this data is actually delivered to the National Observatory of Athens so actually to researchers, to real researchers who are using these data. So how is that happening? Actually, we have to install these, um, 
these seismographs. So firstly, we either, as I told you, find the location that we think it is interesting to have a seismograph and to gather data from there, or schools are expressing interest by themselves telling us that they're interested to host, um, to install actually seismograph in their uh, settings. Then we find a teacher that we can cooperate uh, and will be accountable for the function of the, of, the, of the seismograph. We install the seismograph, we connect it with a computer so that it starts getting all this information, all this uh, data from the seismic activity, and then spread it and circulate it to the whole network. Actually, we're talking about data collection. Data collection that you can take it as raw data, as you can see, at any time, which could be uh, very interesting for researchers, but unfortunately not so interested for, interesting for teachers and students. Because as you can see, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the SAC files as a format. These files are not very easily used by normal computers that you can find in a lab, uh, in a computer lab in a, in a normal school. So these, in the, this format can mostly be useful for researchers of the field. What we're doing for that, for, to, to facilitate um, educational activities is that we host this seismic data on Helix. Okay, a very good example of how a paradigm of how that worked very nicely was the Hack Week 2019 that we have cooperated in cooperation with Helix, where we did um, an experiment. We have asked from students and teachers to use open research data obtained from the network in order to create an, I'm sorry, an early warning system, an app that would work as an early warning system in case of an earthquake. I just have added here um, an image just to uh, help you understand a little what, when, what we mean by saying an early warning system. Actually, as you can see here, if we said that this is the epicenter of, a, of, a, of an earthquake, the waves these waves are damaging, but as they, um, as they move, they become less damaging, but at the same time, they are getting closer to big cities. So if we can have the data from several um, spots uh, of the, the area, we can report and we can warn citizens living in uh, big city centers to be prepared. Okay, so imagine the, the, the return uh, to the to the society, and how how easily that can happen. So, in order to help uh, the teachers, as I told you, we gave them um, the data from several seismographs of five different big earthquakes that have already taken place. They had to take advantage of this data in order to create a this app that could be up and playing. Unfortunately, we managed to complete only the first part. So we have uh, managed to train, uh, to train the teachers so that they can work as mentors for their uh, students. But we are still missing the second part where the, the students will actually develop this app because unfortunately COVID had other plans and we are not allowed to have any um, meetings with the students and teachers at the time. So this is a, a, a remaining task, but it's, it's a very good a paradigm of how uh, research data was placed on, um, on Helix and would be very easily used by citizens in our case, students. So when we're talking about citizen science and education, we can actually talk about teachers presenting research data and expose uh, students to the uh, methodology of scientific research. Imagine how, uh, how interesting that is at these times that the growing mistrust to science is uh, uh, highlighted. We can have hands-on activities where students themselves can have hands-on activities and implement 
take part in the research themselves. But what we were actually missing is give them the floor. So in order for them to feel as real scientists who, who have been uh, analyzing real um, research data, we wanted to offer them a platform to publish their work. And that's why we have created the Open Schools Journal for Open Science. We're talking actually about an international scientific journal from students to students. This is the second initiative that I've shown in the beginning. Um, it follows all the rules of a scientific journal uh, with peer review processes. And at the moment, we have 233 users registered, 140 students and teachers who have uh, been authors, 98 reviewers. This is very, very important for us because in order to keep having um, peer review processes, we have to make sure that we have reviewers for as many languages as, as possible and also as many fields as possible. We have 240 published items. We're talking about items because we're, they can be either posters or full articles. And we have 13 issues published so far with some more to be um, published by the end of this uh, year. This is how an example article looks. We have the title, we have the, the authors, the DOI, of course, the abstracts, and one, once someone clicks on this PDF, uh, we get the actual article. Authors have to follow the guidelines that we have created. So there is a specific template that they have to follow. It is available in English and, of course, in the languages that you can see on the, on the left in order to help uh, teachers to, to make their lives easier, actually, because, you know, it's not very easy for all students and teachers to write in English. And, of course, because the journal is an international initiative and we, we celebrate this uh, multinational uh, nature of the journal, actually. As I said, we follow peer review processes and therefore everything is done in secrecy. But what we can offer to reviewers is a certificate of re reviewing uh, as the least we can do to express our uh, gratitude for their um, contribution to our uh, journal. Also, everything that is uploaded on the journal is also uploaded on the Z Zenodo community with all the details and all the metadata that Zenodo is asking for. Last, the Nobel Prize Physics on Zenodo. This is an initiative that is mostly um, that mostly has to do with Zenodo. Actually, we are we have created educational activities that use research from big infrastructures, big science research infrastructures that can be easily used in class. Some of them. Um, are even um, involving the, 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 the analysis of research data from students and researcher are, researchers are, ask, uh, are actually counting on the return of these analyses, the outcome of these analyses back to the scientific community. So you can find here an open dialogue between students and researchers and not just an open dialogue, but actually a productive dialogue, because we can see that researchers are often offering some of the data that they can to the educational community with a great impact that that can have on both the education, but also to the forming of the future responsible science of uh, citizens and also the return to the scientific community by the analysis of uh, the students. Here we can measure the, the, the views and the downloads of these educational activities and for the time we know that 235 resources have been downloaded by teachers and students and would have been implemented in class. Uh, and uh, last, we would like to share with you the news of a good practice example in one of our um, of the articles that have been published in our journal. There's a Greek article of some students. You can see their names here. That's a big team. That uh, here you can see the the, the translation of uh, their actual text that they have um, announced that they have identified an exoplanet orbit around a, a specific star 
that this team has analyzed for the very first time. So we are happy to share that there has been a, a new discovery um, uh, published in our journal from students. So thank you. That was from me. This is my mail in case you want to be into contact and you are interested. So any questions? Thank you so much, Eugenia. Um, yeah, please put any, any questions because I mean, the, the topic is a bit different from uh, those that you hear that you heard before, but it's very much connected to them as well at the same time. So in case you have any questions, please use the Q&A box. Uh, the next speaker uh, in, in line is Manolis Terovitis from the Athena Research Center as well that will speak about Amnesia, the open air data anonymization tool. Uh, we can't hear you, though. <laughs> uh, not yet. Let me see if I can unmute you. Yes, yes. Okay, I, uh, okay, great. It works I now. I opened the video, but not... Uh, no worries, microphone. that happens. Thank you, Laria, for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, I will share my screen and talk to you about uh, data anonymization and... Uh, the an amnesia anonymization tool. So I'm sharing and I'm going to put it on. Uh, on screen. Uh, sorry. Okay. So uh, maybe you have already heard Amnesia, uh, but uh, here you'll get a chance to get a high level uh, uh, presentation of uh, what it does. So, as I said in the beginning, Am Amnesia is a data anonymization tool that is offered through Opener. And uh, the first question that uh, comes up and, uh, in many contexts is why anonymize? What is anonymization? So I would like to go to the definitions of GDPR uh, and make the distinction between pseudo-anonymization and uh, anonymization. Uh, pseudo-anonymization is uh, the removal of uh, direct identifiers of names, of uh, social security numbers, and other things that uh, directly pinpoint a person, and uh, the replacement uh, with maybe a random identifier. Uh, this is called pseudo-anonymization because given external uh, information like uh, the map that we kept when we did the substitution or the combined uh, uh, information of uh, other secondary identifying uh, data like uh, the date of birth and the zip code where someone lives, we can go back to the data and re-identify the people that are described in the pseudonymized data set. So a pseudonymized data set offers some protection. It is uh, an, easy, uh, an easy precaution step that we can take in several contexts, but uh, the data are still considered personal and this should be handled with uh, every uh, every guarantee that GDPR uh, requires. Anonymization is the reversible transformation of data uh, from personal to statistical. Uh, now, the, there's a lot of discussion and I will not go in depth that uh, irreversible uh, against non-irreversible is a clear a clear distinction in uh, when we talk in everyday life, but from a technical perspective, uh, the, the boundaries are not that clear. Something we may not have an irreversible, an irreversible uh, transformation, but we may be able to infer information about people from anonymized data. But if, even if uh, we do not uh, pay this much attention to the details, the idea of anonymization is to have a guarantee uh, uh, on how the data are transformed. A guarantee would say that uh, a third party that has uh, background information that, uh, about the date of birth and the zip code of a person will not be able to identify uh, this person in the published data set with probability uh, more than uh, 10%. 
th th this is a guarantee. Uh, other things might be able uh, to be identified, but this is a guarantee that we did the job uh, paying attention to anonymization and the data that result from this, uh, um, from these processes can be considered statistical data which are no longer personal and we no longer have to take all the measures and precautions that GDPR uh, requir uh, requires. And uh, compared to other methods that uh, we know from the past, like encryption, uh, secure multi-party computation, anonymization is more suitable if we want to reveal uh, the data to third parties that we do not completely trust. Not completely trust does not mean that they're malicious, but uh, there may be researchers that we do, uh, do not know, have not signed a non-disclosure agreement. So uh, a data owner is able by anonymizing the data to deliver them to a wide uh, audience. So uh, this, uh, it, it is very important to have uh, mean, uh, meaningful and effective anonymization and uh, Amnesia does uh, exactly that. So to a bit publicize uh, Amnesia, uh, we try to make it uh, very user friendly Okay, I will accept that still it's as all anonymization, the, the few uh, available anonymization tools, not very friendly because it's a complicated procedure, but we have put effort and we think it's the most user friendly that's out there. Uh, it works locally. You can see it in our site. Uh, uh, we have an online version that you can use for demonstration and training purposes. But if you want to really anonymize sensitive data, you can download it and run all the process in your premises without the data ever leaving uh, your safe uh, environment. Um, we put effort in uh, giving the users many uh, degrees of freedom in customizing the anonymization process. Uh, we do have some very specific features based on uh, our, our basic research results we had in the past. So uh, we, it's the unique uh, tool for set value data. This is kind of uh, arbitrary uh, data records of arbitrary length. Uh, we do have a, uh, a unique version of K-anonymity for high dimensional data, which is a common um, case in practice, KM anonymity. And we do offer, uh, apart from the uh, graphical interface, we offer a, a REST API that allows to incorporate Amnesia easily to third party tools. So uh, as long as it's up, it had uh, 32,000 visitors in the open air portal. We had more than 100,000 page views and uh, 2,000 unique downloads. So this is just uh, a glimpse of its popularity and uh, the interest is actually growing. Uh, we have just launched a new site, so feel free to go there and uh, give us feedback and also let us know if you need more uh, documentation or what is not very easy to, uh, uh, to understand because uh, uh, for us that have been working there, you know, it's a problem of engineers. Sometimes things are uh, ob obvious because we have worked for them for so long, but they're not for the users. So we put an effort on providing good documentation, but. Uh, I'm afraid that in several cases we fall short and we want to, uh, to, to do even a better job there. Um, okay, for the status, uh, we offer anonymization algorithms based on key anonymity. At the moment, we plan to add defensive privacy in the future. We offer for several kinds of data. We have recently released a disk-based algorithm that allows you to anonymize very large data sets. Uh, uh, it's quite technical, this is a quite technical thing, but uh, what it does, it uh, processes the, uh, the data set while it resides on your hard disk, so you're not limited by the main memory, and this allows using uh, a, a big data set. Amnesia uh, is up for quite a long time, so especially in the older futures, the bugs have uh, diminished, and uh, I think it's uh, quite robust, given uh, the complicated process. Now, uh, 
I gave you the overview. For those that are not familiar, I will also give an example of uh, anonymization with guarantees. And this is an example of k anonymity. On the left part, you see uh, some imaginary medical records where you have uh, uh, for patients uh, their zip code, their age, and their nationality. Uh, even if the names have been removed, if you know the zip code and the age of someone, now you can uh, identify the, uh, the record. Uh, on the second uh, page, uh, on the second on the second table on the right, we have. Uh, generalized, that's the term we use, and we have replaced the specific values with more gen uh, general ones, more abstract ones, and now even if you know the zip code and the age of a person, you always have four candidate records uh, for, uh, for it. Uh, one difficult task to do is that you have to create, to provide to the algorithm uh, what we call a generalization hierarchy, and this is how to do the replacements of specific values to more the general ones. And uh, the best way is not to have, you know, this the specific, this the general, and that's it, but to have several steps so the algorithm can generalize as much as needed, but not more, so it won't lose mu uh, much information. Uh, for numbers and dates, uh, amnesia helps you and simplifies this process, but if you have categorical data where the data, this is, uh, for example, labels uh, that have to be grouped according to the semantics, this task has, be, has to be done uh, by the user and it's one of uh, the hard parts in the anonymization process. Uh, so some things about our limitations. Uh, I think after some experience, uh, one of the major limitation is that anonymization process, uh, anonymization has not been used extensively in practice. So users do not know what to expect. We do not have uh, so much feedback, even if 30,000 users have visited the the site, we don't have so, uh, so much feedback for industry in real world cases to uh, foresee uh, problems. So this is an ongoing task. Um, it requires some effort uh, to create uh, rules or in customizing the solution. Uh, we do not have uh, good answers uh, because we only pro create the software on how to set the privacy parameters. Uh, we only recently have examples of the US Census anonymizing the data, or we can follow the practices of the statistical authorities that are in similar methods, but there are no guideline, official guidelines on, for example, what case should you use to care anonymity. And of course, Amnesia has yet fo has the focused until now on care anonymity. There, it has some shortcomings and uh, other also uh, anonymization methods, which we plan to add in the future, but uh, th there's no tool that can actually do everything. So that's all. Uh, I seen chat several questions, but I guess we can do that. Uh, uh, yeah, we will do that later. after after the last presentation. Thanks a lot, Manolis. Okay, it's Thank always interesting uh, hearing of these things, I mean, uh, the topic of anon anonymization is definitely very much relevant because also of GDPR. And I'm always fascinated <laughs> of how uh, Amnesia can work and help researchers. I'm always happy to present it, <laughs> helping <laughs> that, people use it. Yeah, that's good to know. Uh, okay, the last speaker for today before we go to the Q&A is Argyroko Kojanaki from the University of Athens that will speak about the Open Air Explorer uh, that's the search engine uh, of open air, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it to Argiro for more details. Uh, thank you, Gladia. Uh, can you see my screen? Do you see yes, me? it displays correctly. Okay, perfect. So let's start. Um, open Air Explorer is the, the way to, to, to access and explore the Open Air Research Graph and its entities. Um, this is achieved through the search and browse functionality. Uh, the last few months, uh, we have we we worked on uh, updating the user interface and adding new functionalities, and they are all uh, available in explore.openair.eu. 
Uh, the main functionalities of the Explore portal is the search, uh, the linking and deposit. For the current presentation, uh, we will focus on the search functionality in the browse. In the, in the home page and in uh, the rest of the search pages of Explore, uh, you, we can find this bar. Uh, we can search in all the content, all the entities of OpenAir, but we can easily switch with uh, this drop, back, drop down menu to other OpenAir entities. And we can also switch from simple to advanced search. Under the term research outcomes, we have merged together all the research types uh, like publication, research data, software, and other research products. Uh, so we have the option to search for them and see them all together or combine one or more of uh, those subtypes. In the single search, uh, we can use single keyword search, uh, or we can use quotes for exact term uh, search, and we can use uh, persistent identifiers like DOI, ORC ID, DMC, and so on to, to search for specific uh, results. Uh, both in single and advanced search, uh, there are the filters on the left, uh, the, the filters are based on fields that depends on the entity that we have select to, to search. And they, they give us an overview of uh, the values and the numbers of that uh, field. Um, for each field, we saw the top uh, 100 values. And if we click the view all, uh, link, we can see all the values, uh, we can uh, search for a specific value and we have the option to sort uh, the values by the number of results or by the name. In the advanced search, uh, we can create more complex query. Uh, not just single keyword search. And we can use uh, a list of fields. The, the list of fields depends on the entity that we have select uh, to search for. And by using the specific fields and values, we, ha we can define complex queries uh, to search. In each page, we see the search results. We have uh, changed the, the grouping and how the information uh, appears. For example, we have added the ORC ID information for authors, and uh, the re we can search for results with the same ORC ID. For the results, we have the option to, to change the numbers that are visible in one page and change the sorting of the results. And we have also the option to download results uh, in CSV format. If the search that we have applied have more than 2,000 results, we, we are able to download the first 2,000 of them. Uh, if we click on the title of uh, a result, we will go to a more detailed page that has all the information uh, related to, to the result. Those pages, we call them landing pages. And we can see the information of the, for example, here we see a publication. We can see the information about that publication. And in the tabs, we can see relations with other research results. At the bottom of each landing page, we can see the date, the last update, the last uh, date that the records were updated. 
again, we can see the ORCID information and there is the option again to search uh, for results with this specific ORCID. In case this result is the result of the duplication, uh, and this means that uh, in OpenAir we found more than one more uh, than one uh, instances of the same results, and we have merged it to one single record. And here we can see uh, a list of those results that are merged to this uh, record. Uh, we have also the option to, to link this publication with other uh, open air entities like project research outcomes and communities. Uh, and this is done with the linking functionality. This is a project landing page where again we can see information about the project. And in the tabs, we can see relations with other open air entities like publication, software, and so on. If we click on a specific entity, uh, we see the most recent results for that entity. And by clicking the view all button, we can go to the search page where we can apply more filters for uh, the results of this specific project. We can also see statistics for the, for the research outcomes and also user statistics. We can, we, we can uh, include the results of this project to our, to our website uh, using the code available there. Uh, and we can also download reports in CSV and HTML format uh, for the same project. In, uh, in both cases, we can choose what type of results we want to, to have. We can uh, download all the, all the types of research outcomes or select a specific uh, type like publications. Again, here we have the option to link this project uh, with uh, other research results. Uh, again, this is uh, happening through the linking functionality. And we have the option to, to search for results in open air that they already exist in open air or link with uh, results from Crossref, data sites and Torque. Uh, here we can have uh, also information about uh, how we can deposit uh, our research in uh, a repository. This is a data source landing page. Uh, again, here we have tabs with uh, with relations with entities that are uh, related to this uh, specific data source. Uh, we have the, the option to go to the search page and see and apply more filters uh, for the publications of this data source. We can see the statistics about the results of this data source and use the statistics related to, to the results of this data source. Uh, this is uh, the organization landing page. Uh, again, here we have relations with other open air entities like projects, publications, and so on. We can again go and see the, the, that result in the search page. And we have the option to download reports for this specific organization uh, in HTML or CSV format. In, uh, in all landing page, uh, on bottom right, there, there is this uh, link to report an issue. If you click on this uh, link, this page will open uh, and what we can do here is 
to specify a field from the page that we, we started that has wrong information or in, um, some information is missing. So we, we can specify where this, uh, what is missing. Some, is something wrong in the title, for example? Describe what is wrong with that. Uh, we can add more than one issues. And we can leave our email there so the Open Air team can contact back to you, to us, uh, for the status of this uh, issue. The, the email is, uh, is not uh, mandatory, but if you want someone to come back to you, you should leave your email there. And uh, this is our team for developing and designing the, the Explore portal. And that's all from me. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Argyro and the team. This is wonderful. And thank you everyone for your excellent presentations, sir, and for keeping time. And also thank you for sending your questions, sir. So we have some questions answered already and uh, some still pending uh, in a QA. and a And uh, I suggest that we go through them. Uh, so the, the, the first one. So the, the, uh, the first one is from uh, Bilana, and uh, it's a question to Ellie about Argos. Uh, if we decide to translate Argos in our language, who is the first person in Argos to contact? And I can already answer that it's Ellie. <laughs> Do you want to add anything to that, Ellie? Yes, yes. It would be me, but it would be nice if you could also uh, send the send the email to this address as well. I added in the, in the chat, it's argos at openair.eu. And myself, like you will receive my email in the presentation you will find in the last slide of the presentation. And should I continue? I see that yes, and, and, and maybe read a second question. Okay, so the second question is, our local funder includes something like the MP in few last calls. If we want to include this in Argos as a template, do we need some special rights? or we could do it as a DMP manager. Uh, no, you cannot do it as a DMP manager. You, you don't have administrative rights to the use of uh, Argos tool, but you can send us this, uh, this request to us and we can do it for you and in collaboration with you so that we make sure that everything works fine and it's uh, according to your needs. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. And uh, then we have a question from Regis. And uh, I think it was uh, about the part when uh, we presented the guides and uh, all other outputs of task forces. And I'll, I'll read this question. Uh, thanks for all this interesting info. I work with researchers uh, who'd find all this uh, intel quite useful. However, I'm afraid that all of them speak read English. Is it okay if I provide on my institution's website some translations, part partial or complete in our country language while linking to the original content on Zenodo or openair.eu? I'm not sure about the specific licenses of this content. Thank you for the answer. So our openair portal is, li uh, is um, licensed CC BY, and uh, I guess that's also the license on the guides, but maybe Ellie should correct me, Ellie Dyke. And, and of course, we, we welcome uh, translations. Uh, yes, I think we welcome translations. And but but from which country is this? So maybe Regis, you 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 led. Uh, uh, France. Yes, you can also contact the NOAT of uh, of France. I think. And it's Coupera Andre de uh, Andre, yeah, yeah. But we'll we'll, we'll be happy if if you translate them. Yes, yes, sure. Thanks a lot. And then we have two likes uh, to Regis Coleman. Thanks a lot, Manolis. This was very interesting. So that's, that's a thank you. 
Then a question uh, to Ellie again, Ellie, Ellie uh, Papadopoulos about Argus. Uh, is Argus only a pilot uh, or productive and robust software? No, no, it's, it's in production. I will also share with you our uh, specifications here. And you can also find it in uh, the EOS catalog and in the Open Air Service catalog. It's, it's in full mode, it's, it's ready. Thanks. Then a question from Emma uh, to Eugenia. Maybe I missed it, but how old are the students? Hi, um, it depends. It, we cover uh, both primary and secondary education. Uh, do you also have articles of primary school students? Yes, we do actually. We do That's because cool. we have um, we have organized a school seismograph uh, um, competition that they had to create uh, seismographs with uh, everyday elements and materials. And uh, we had the participation from a primary school. And they have also uh, written an article about the whole procedure. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. So, then a question to Argiro and Katerina about Explore. Uh, can authors claim their works, sir? Are the works included uh, in an ORCID record added to the search index? And uh, are they shown when uh, searching for a certain author? Uh, author authors can claim their works. Uh, this is possible through the, the linking functionality. I didn't go uh, on detail uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, but this is possible. Uh, you in the linking functionality, you can uh, give the ORC ID and see the link, see the a list of the ORCIDs of the author's works, uh, and they can claim the. Uh, actually, they can link with the project or other open air entities. But uh, we are planning to integrate the search and link functionality of ORCID, the search and link wizard, where uh, authors will be able to, to add in their ORCID profiles uh, publications from OpenAir, from Explore, uh, and save that information in Explore. We will add the ORCID information. Thanks a lot. And next question also about Explore. How does it relate to data site commons? Are they connected or working anyhow together? So I can start that uh, we, we are connected. We collaborate with data site uh, for data related information, but we have more than just data. We also have publications, software, other outputs. And um, I don't know if you want to add something to that, Argiro and Katerina? No, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Matthijs asked uh, a question about amnesia. So over to you, Manolis, uh, and I'll read it. Do you know if any clinical research project to use to anonymize data, DOI? Uh, I'm we have used amnesia in my health my data project uh, this was not a pure clinical this was not a clinical research project it was actually a project on providing an uh, anonymization and uh, gdpr compliant solutions uh, to health practitioners uh, and hospitals so uh, we tested it with some uh, sample data from uh, uh, Bart's uh, hospital in the uh, uk uh, but uh, we do not have results uh, if uh, that's the questions on how it affected, for example, uh, uh, specific models or tasks that were done on anonymization mod, uh, on an anonymized data. Uh, this is actually some work that I would like to do. And if uh, Matthias is interested in working on that, I would be happy to help with uh, amnesia anonymizing data that can be used for his work and see how it affects the quality of the results. Thanks a lot, Manolis. And then we have a question from Marie-Claude, again about Explore. 
to our heroine Katerina. In Open Air Explore, it would be useful first to display the list of all sources of content. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll read it all and then you'll, you'll answer in pieces. Two, uh, explain the difference between content providers collected from content providers and hosting content providers. The user could search more precisely in the database and know what exactly the different fields mean and contain. Uh, I found this comment uh, very useful uh, and we will uh, uh, try to integrate this uh, explaining the, the different fields. But if you uh, really want me to, to explain the difference, <laughs> I really can't. Uh, you know if Alessia is here and can help. Just a second, I'll, I'll, I'll make my, Alessia is here, but she's not a presenter. So let me make her a presenter. Uh, in the meantime, I could add something. Hi, it's Katerina speaking. Uh, if a user wants to see all the content providers uh, that contributed the content of Open Earth Explorer, uh, you can go to the menu and click the content providers link. There you can see uh, all uh, all the content providers of whatever type uh, we have uh, in open air and there are the research that uh, you can do and there are filters that uh, can help you narrow down your, your search. Also, it is important to, to say that for everything that you see in open air, every uh, research output, uh, you always uh, see on the right side of, of your page, of your screen, which are the content providers uh, that uh, actually provided all this uh, information. In uh, many cases, for, for the research output that you see for, for one single record, uh, there could be multiple content providers. Everyone is listed there, uh, so everyone is getting their credit and their uh, visibility. Mary Claude also added, we can, uh, we get only 100 first providers. I'm not sure that's the case. I think you can you can see all of them. We see in in the general search, in the filters on the left. This is correct because these are only uh, filters, uh, so they help you, um, let's say, uh, narrow down the results of the search that you have already uh, done. But uh, I don't know if I can share my screen. If you go. Uh, to the menu of Open Air, it search the posit link, and then there is a, a link for content providers. There you can search for any content uh, provider and we give you uh, uh, useful filters on the left. Should I share my screen? Yep, yep, you can share. So just uh, stop sharing Ilaria's screen and start sharing yours. And Alessia is here. Do you want to add anything to that, Alessia? Uh, no, I think Katerina explained very well where to go to find the list of all content providers from which uh, uh, we collect from. Uh, I can, let's say, give some details on the other part of the questions. Because um, Open Air collects from content providers in, in two ways. One, uh, the, the first is that we directly harvest metadata records from the provider. And the other type of harvesting is what we call the indirect harvest, because we basically collect from an aggregator, which in turn collects from another one. And the actual, um, file of the research results is typically stored on the original content provider. So the difference is that we collected the metadata records from one content provider, but the resource is hosted by another content provider. And this is the difference that we want to uh, express in the landing pages of, uh, of the research results. 
we used to have these um, two filters also in the uh, explore search page, but uh, we understood that it was uh, a little bit complicated <laughs> to explain. Uh, and so currently you, you can only see one filter by content provider. So when uh, Argiro and Katerina, together with the support of our team in user experience, will find a nice way to make it clear the difference between the two fields in a few words, then we can uh, add it back also in the, on the side, let's say, so well, among the filters. Thanks a lot, uh, Alessia and Katerina and Arugiro. So I only see one remaining question from Oscar to Manolis. Which version of Amnesia is the latest? I have 1.2.1. Is this the latest? Thanks. And I don't see any other questions, sir. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, many, many thanks to our wonderful speakers, uh, Nigela, Alex, uh, Argiro, Eli, Eli, Eugenia, Manolis, uh, Marina. Uh, thanks for joining us for day uh, four of Open Air Week. Uh, so we have uh, recordings from uh, previous days uh, on the program page, which I also put in the chat. Uh, and uh, tomorrow we'll have a session, um, Open Air Services for Research Communities. Uh, so please join us uh, if uh, you're interested and have time. Thanks again and uh, have a nice afternoon, uh, evening, uh, maybe for some of you it's still morning. Thank you everyone. Bye.